Hi Church, it is now more than six weeks we've been under this movement control order and we just recently heard that uh, some of the restrictions have been eased so I'm sure all of us are glad to have a little bit more liberty restored to our lives to be able to move out of the house a little bit uh, and, and perhaps for some of you to go back to work to go out and do a short run it's a relief okay but I think we should be rem reminded that the virus is still with us in our communities, so still maintain social distancing. Well, we're continuing on our series on the Apostles' Creed. Uh, Pastor Chris took the first three. He spoke about God, God the Father, and also he introduced this section about Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. Now, the passage I want to read uh, for us to read from today is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. So will you, if you can, stand and read this passage with me. Okay, reading together. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you that you revealed yourself to us in your word, most perfectly through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. So Father, today as we consider the truths of you that have been passed on through generations of Christians, through churches over the centuries, Father, we ask, that you will speak to our hearts and teach us what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, what it means to be a child of God, to be the people of God on this earth. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Church, I have entitled this message, Empty Tomb to Highest Throne. Now, we started this whole series on the Apostles' Creed a few weeks ago, and we said we try to memorize it or at least get a little bit more familiar with it. So we're going to recite the creed together, okay? You, the, you might be sitting down, it's fine. Okay, so let's just recite the creed together now. All right, what's on the screen? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now I'm just going to ask us to focus on uh, the part that we have been, that I've been preaching from, from the last, in these two weeks. Okay, this section is about the Lord Jesus Christ. So will you read with me uh, from the top of the creed till the end of the boxed section, okay? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. So I'm preaching today from uh, about the box section, about the resurrection, ascension, exaltation, and the return of Jesus. Now this whole section is, is you might say, is an expansion of that statement that I believe in Jesus Christ, 
his only son, our Lord. And I asked the question last week, why should Jesus be our Lord? What qualifies him? What did he do? What elevated him to that position to be Lord? I'm going to continue to answer that question today. The big idea for today is that Jesus, our Lord, is the Lord and our returning King. Now, the first thing we note from this passage is, uh, from this part of the creed, it talks about the resurrection. It says that Jesus rose from the dead. The third day, he rose from the dead. Now, this resurrection didn't happen unannounced. In fact, Jesus spoke to Mary and said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And Mary and God, Jesus asked Mary, Do you believe this in John 11? Now, this was just before Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Now, Mary and Martha believed in the resurrection, uh, as do all good, good Jews at that time. They believed in the resurrection, but at the end of the age, at the end of time, at the close of human history. But Jesus comes along and says, No, it happens when I say it happens. And he raised Lazarus from the dead soon after this. So the promise of the resurrection was there. And Jesus came and fulfilled that promise first in raising Lazarus, you might say for some people, ahead of time. But more than that, the promise was fulfilled when he was raised from the dead. Now the promise of the resurrection is not just to Mary and Martha and the Jews, and not only about Jesus being raised from the dead, the promise of the resurrection is also to us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, it says, By His power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and He will raise us also. So the promise of the resurrection was seen in its fulfillment when Jesus rose from the dead. And because Jesus rose from the dead, we will be raised as well. Now, there are passages there. There are other passages there you can check out from Romans, 2 Corinthians, and Philippians. Now, that's the first thing I would say about the resurrection, that there is a promise of resurrection. There was one, and there is one. But the resurrection is also a proof of Jesus' claim, of Jesus' claim first that He is God. Paul writes in Romans chapter 1, concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus was declared to be the son of God in power. It's this proof that he was the son of God by his resurrection from the dead. So it proved that Jesus was the Son of God. But more than that, it also proved that He was the Messiah. In Acts chapter 2, Luke records uh, Peter's message, and Peter stands up and says to the crowd there, he says, God raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it, speaking of Himself and of the apostles. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Peter is saying when Jesus rose from the dead, it was not only just proven to be God, but it's also proven to be the Christ, the Messiah. So Jesus' resurrection proves that He is the Son of God and that He is the Christ. It also tells us that there is a promise of our resurrection one day. But you know, Without the resurrection, there would be even no salvation for us. Paul writes in Romans chapter 4, verse 25, He was delivered over to death for our sins. That's Good Friday. He was delivered over to death on Good Friday for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Easter Sunday. Paul says, both these things come together. He was delivered over to death. He died on the cross for our sins. And He was raised to life for our 
justification. Now, there were some uh, in Paul's days who said, ah, this whole resurrection idea is, uh, you know, it sounds nice, but there's no such thing. In fact, we're not going to be raised in our body. Well, Paul had to refute this in 1 Corinthians 15. And it got to the point where he says, look guys, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Paul boils it down to this. If there is no resurrection, there is no forgiveness. There is no justification. When Jesus rose from the dead, it tells the universe that God accepted the sacrifice of Christ on Good Friday. You know, C.H. Spurgeon wrote this. He said, Upon a life I did not live, upon a death I did not die, I risk my whole eternity on the resurrection. That simply says, the resurrection is everything. The resurrection confirms Good Friday to be good. So what does it mean for us? You know, Paul translates this. He says in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. He says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Paul is saying, when Christ rose from the dead, we were also raised with Him. Those of us who have placed our trust in Him, we are in Christ. So when Christ rose from the dead, we have been raised with Him. And he's saying, if we have been raised with Him, something changed. And something needs to change in our lives. He says, set your heart on things above. Set your minds on things above. What does this mean? I like to put it this way. Let your raised with Christ position relocate the center of your life. Relocate the focus of your life. Relocate, readjust, or reorient the perspective we have of life. We are no longer to live as we were outside of Christ. We are now to live as we are in Christ, which is we are a new creation. We are royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. And there's so much to say about who we are now in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying, don't live the old way. Live the new way, the new person that you are, a new creation in Christ. Live that way. Live your life knowing that your life is safe, your salvation is safely in God's hands. Live your every day knowing that God watches over you. Do your work knowing that when you do your work faithfully, God is faithful. He will bring your work to fruition. So Jesus has been raised from the dead. And in that resurrection, we are reminded there is a promise also of our resurrection. It is a proof that Jesus is the Son of God and is the Messiah. And it is the resurrection that affirms that Friday, Good Friday, was good because the Father accepted the sacrifice of the Son for your sins, for my sins. We have been justified by His resurrection. The big idea again is Jesus, our Lord, is the Lord and our returning King. Now about the ascension. The ascension is that Jesus is now at the Father's right hand. And that portion of the creed reads, He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father. What happened when Jesus ascended? Jesus ascended to send the Holy Spirit. Now Jesus had promised His disciples that this would happen. In John 16, verse uh, 7, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send Him to you. Now Jesus is telling His disciples numerous times in between John 14 and John uh, 15, 
and 16. It's talking about Him going and Him then sending the Holy Spirit. But you might say, so if He sends the Holy Spirit, why? What good does it do? Is it any good? Well, when the Holy Spirit comes and when the Holy Spirit came, He comes to be with us and in us. And He comes to empower us. He comes to change our lives. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, Paul writes to Timothy and says, The Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Jesus told his disciples, Hey, you know, go to Jerusalem, wait there. Wait there until the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will receive power, power from on high, power to be my witnesses so that those who were previously hiding away in fear of the Jews would stand up and preach boldly even when threatened with stones. The Spirit of God comes to empower us, but the Spirit of God also comes to show us God's love, to pour the love of the Father into our hearts. The Holy Spirit also comes and when we work with Him and when we walk in with Him, He changes our lives. He bears in us the characteristics of Jesus Christ, of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. All those listed in, in Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Jesus ascended to send us the Holy Spirit. But Jesus also ascended to intercede for us. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 24 and 25, it reads like this, But because Jesus lives forever, He has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, He is able to save completely those who come to God through Him, because He always lives to intercede for them because Jesus always lives to intercede for us. When Jesus ascended and is seated at the right hand of the Father, He is there interceding for us in our lives. You know, this intercession means that, and moreover, being the most empathetic high priest we could ever have, the struggles we go through, the weaknesses we have, and the petitions that we bring to the Father. Jesus is there to intercede for us. Jesus is there to make our case with us, for us. Jesus intercedes for us. When you come to the Father, you don't come to the Father alone. You come to the Father with Jesus by your side. That's what He does for us. And he did, is able to do that because he ascended to the Father. But also when Jesus ascended, he ascended the throne as Lord. No longer as the God-man who was crucified on the cross. Not even as the resurrected Savior. When he ascended to the throne, he ascended as Lord. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 to 11, in the passage we read at the beginning, it reads from verse 9, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What this verse simply says is that because Jesus lowered himself so low, God raised him to the highest place to be Lord of all. That's what it means when it says that in heaven and on earth and under the earth, you know, everywhere lah, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, Jesus Christ, the Lord, is ever backing us in intercession and empowering us through the Holy Spirit, which he, whom He sent to live, to help us to live in this world 
as his royal emissaries. So we see, firstly, in the resurrection, the resurrection of Christ portends our eventual resurrection in the body as well. The resurrection of Christ is proof of his deity, of him being the Messiah. The resurrection of Christ, we might say, bought our salvation together with his sacrifice. And the ascension, because Jesus ascended, he sends us the Holy Spirit who lives in us, empowers us to help us live this life, this new life that we have. But Jesus there by the Father's side also intercedes for us, even as he rules as Lord, so that we know that as we live as his people, our Master, our Lord, has all authority in heaven and on earth. My big idea again is that Jesus, our Lord, is the Lord and our returning King. The last thing, the return of Christ. Jesus will be back. The last phrase of the part of the creed that I'm preaching from is reads, and will come again, Jesus, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Now we talk about the return of Christ. Every time we, we do Holy Communion, because we will probably read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, it will be part of the liturgy, which reads, Paul writes this, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. We all know Jesus is coming back because we are reminded each time. We are also reminded in the, uh, in the portion of the liturgy which uh, describes the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Well, when Jesus comes again, He will return for us. That's what Jesus told His disciples. In John 14, verse 3, Jesus told them, He says, And if I go, and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. When Jesus returns, He returns for His people. He returns for His disciples to take us to be with Him, to be in His Father's house. You know, what, what's going to happen when Jesus comes and takes us? Well, Paul writes in Philippians and he tells us this, when Jesus comes and takes us, there will be an enormous transformation, a glorious change. Let me read from Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. Our lowly bodies, this body that gets tired, this body that gets thirsty, hungry, sick, that eventually die, this body will be transformed so that they will be like Jesus' glorious body. Now, don't ask me what that glorious body looks like, but I, for me, the description glorious is Pretty good, okay? Not so excited about walking, walking through the wall, you know, those kind of stuff. But yeah, I'm glad that Jesus ate, okay, with his disciples after the resurrection. That tells me, hey, I'm going to get to eat in that glorious body as well. We talk about Jesus' return. But often, one would have to wonder, do we really anticipate Jesus' return? Are we looking forward? to his return? Or have we gotten so comfortable with this world? And, and, and you have to admit, this world is a beautiful world. Or have we been blind to the brokenness of this world? Because if we have been blind to the brokenness of this world, we don't see why there needs to be a different one and a better one. I'd like to quote you something from A.W. Tozer. He writes this, he says, the crux of the whole matter is this our wonderful created world will be restored to its rightful owner. I, for one, look forward to that day. I want to live here when Jesus Christ owns and rules the world. 
Until that hour, there will be conflict, distress, and war among the nations. We will hear of suffering and terror and fear and fail. And I, if I might add to Dozer's words, pandemics, economic collapse, social unrest. But the God who promised, who has promised a better world, is the God who cannot lie. He will shake loose Satan's hold on this world and its societies and systems. Our Heavenly Father will put this world into the hands that were once nailed to a cross for our race of proud and alienated sinners. It is a fact. Jesus Christ is returning to earth. And when I read what Toza writes, I feel his anticipation. When we look at our world, when we look at the brokenness of our world, when we look at the misery around the world of people oppressed politically, economically, socially, when we see our world being exploited, the earth being degraded, our environment falling apart, and you might say, environment turning against us, and societies walling themselves up these days, countries and nations becoming more and more nationalistic, and ignoring the rest of the world is always ours first. And we see a human race fighting among themselves. I pray that we will anticipate Jesus' return. That we will look to that day when Jesus will come back and restore the world to its rightful state and its good state. If you think the world is beautiful now, is good now, you ain't seen nothing yet. Because when Jesus returns, that new earth, it's going to be so much better. Jesus will return for us. Jesus will return as King of kings and Lord of lords. When Jesus comes back, He will not come as He came the last time. He came in humility. He came as a baby helpless. He came to be insulted. He came to be beaten, oppressed, treated unjustly. But when Jesus comes again, He will come as King of kings and Lord of lords. Revelation 7, chapter 17, verse 14 says, The Lamb will triumph over them because He is Lord of lords and King of kings. Chapter 19, verse 6, On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. In this phrase, King of kings and Lord of lords, it's not the first time used in reference to Jesus. You know, you, you just do a check in the concordance, you find that different kings, or you might say these days, emperors called themselves King of kings. Uh, when they, they were a suzerain who had vassal kings uh, submitting to them, he became a king of kings. Uh, there are several of them named in the Bible. Basically, king of kings and lord of lords simply means the supreme ruler. And when Jesus comes back, he will come back as the supreme ruler of the earth, of the entire universe. Every authority will be subject to him. That's our Jesus. That's the one who is coming back, not Jesus, meek and mild. It is Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. What does this mean for us? I think it's important for us to remember that this Jesus of ours is king. Oh yeah, he's already king now. One day, everyone will know that he is king of kings. But today, he's already king of kings. It's just that it's not so obvious. But to us who are His people, He is our King. And He is already King of the universe. John Newton penned his words, Thou art coming to a King, large petitions with thee bring, for His grace and paras are such, none could ever ask too much. We know Jesus to be king. 
let our request of Him not be small. Because He is the King of the universe. He has power to give and to accomplish more than we could ask. So ask. You know, uh, Vance Havner wrote this and I thought, this helps me to understand what it means to anticipate Jesus' return. He writes this, Looking for a train to arrive is one thing, but looking for someone we love to come on that train is another matter. With regard to our Lord's return, we emphasize preparation without expectation. Of course, all too generally, nothing is said of His return at all. Bringing in the kingdom is preached, but not bringing back the king. Bringing back the king. Welcoming the king back. The creed reminds us that he will come back to judge the living and the dead. Oh yeah, he will come to judge. I think we all kind of know that. But he will come also as king of kings and lords of, lord of lords to rightfully rule heaven and earth. When that day comes, things will change. Our bodies will be transformed. But the world will be different because Jesus will truly be king. Someone else wrote, he says, I want to be there. I want to be there living when Je- in that place where Jesus rules as king, where Jesus governs with utter righteousness and love. Jesus Christ is coming back. Again, if might be just recap on my message, I talked about the resurrection. The resurrection reminds us that the portion of the resurrection in the creed reminds us that we will one day be raised with Christ, even as Jesus Christ himself was raised in the body. His resurrection is proof that he's the Son of God and he's the Messiah. And his resurrection is confirmation his sacrifice for our sins has been accepted by the Father and it results in our justification. The ascension, when Jesus ascended to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to live in us, to empower us, to show us the Father's love, to teach us truth, to comfort us. And Jesus is there now at the Father's right hand, interceding for us, advocating on our behalf, as we bring our petitions to the Father. And Jesus at the right hand of God the Father rules as Lord. And one day, this Lord Jesus Christ will return for us. He will return for us and we will be transformed in our bodies, gloriously transformed. And when Jesus returns, He will return as King of Kings and Lord of Lords in all His glory. The big idea again is this, that Jesus our Lord is the Lord and our returning King. So what does it mean for us practically? Well, firstly, a reminder that we are to live our lives as one who has been raised with Christ. We are to live our lives having the center of our lives relocated. The center of life before we are followers of Jesus Christ have been ourselves. Because we live from a perspective of this world. But now raised with Christ, we are to live a life from a perspective of Christ. We are to live no longer as we were. We are to live as we are now. A new creation in Christ. As a new creation with an identity firmly in Jesus Christ a new identity where we are the children of God, loved by the Father and embraced and accepted by Him. We live today as a new creation in Christ, walking each day in the confidence that our Heavenly Father watches over us, living in the confidence that the Holy Spirit who is in us empowers us to live each day as His ambassadors, as His emissaries. And Jesus is always backing us Jesus is there interceding for us. When we make our petitions to the Father, 
Jesus is there, arguing, so you might say, arguing on our behalf. Not that the Father is reluctant, but it is there just to embolden our petition. Jesus empowers us by His Spirit to live in this world as His royal emissaries. We are children of the King. Now, this King is coming back. Because this King is coming back, it should stir our hearts to look forward with a joyous anticipation of a new earth, of a new eternity. That while this earth is degrading, it will come to a point when Jesus returns, it will be overwhelmed with newness because Jesus will bring a new earth. His imminent return should also steal our determination to persevere today in our duties as those who represent Him in this world. We today are emissaries of the King in an environment which has been rebellious to this King of ours. Uh, we as emissaries are there to call people back to Him, to show that our King is the good, gracious, loving, self-sacrificing King, the King who offered grace, mercy. Oh yes, He will come to judge. He will come to judge. But right now, the message is that before He judges, He offers mercy, compassion. You might say even amnesty, if we, would, if we will but come to Him, the ruling King. Jesus is coming back. And I believe that as we think about this, it will challenge the way we live, it will challenge the way we uh, live our, do our work, uh, live our lives uh, with our families, our homes, the way we uh, look at our finances, um, the way we think about our businesses. Jesus is not only Lord of our religious life, Jesus is Lord of all as aspects, all spheres of our lives. Your business, your job, your home, your wallet, all these things come under the purview of this Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, our Savior. You know, the Lordship of Jesus, for you and I, who are disciples of Jesus Christ, is not an academic matter. It is intensely practical. And my prayer is that we would, as His people, ponder deeply about what it means for Jesus to be Lord, as it were for Him to have the steering wheel of our lives. Because He is King. He is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. He is coming back. Now, for some of you, you are not Christians. Um, you wouldn't call yourself a Christian. You're not a follower of Jesus Christ. But maybe as you're hearing this and as you may have been encountering Christians and been thinking about it, and you're asking yourself, hey, how do I, how do I become a Christian? How do I acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord? Well, I did this years ago. It might encapsulate it in three words. Sorry, thank you, please. I said sorry to God for my living in defiance of His sovereignty, of His rule, of His authority over me. I was a rebel, a rebel to God. And I had to bend my knee and acknowledge that I was a rebel and to say that He is my King. That is what the Bible calls sin, rebellion against God. I had to say sorry. Then I said thank you. I said thank you to Jesus for showing me the way back to God, for opening my eyes about my rebellion. And then for Him giving His life so as to pay for my debt in sin. And lastly, I said, please, as I asked and invited Jesus to be my Savior and my Lord, as I came under His authority, and I asked Him to fill me with His Spirit. That's what I did years ago, 
Maybe that's what you want to do today. Now, if you'd like to do that, okay, I'm just going to pray. Okay, uh, you might say a sample prayer. Uh, you could follow after me as, uh, if you like, okay, as I do this. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sorry for my sin, my sin of rebellion, my sin of disregard and disrespect of God. I acknowledge that you are right, God, in saying that I am a sinner. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying on the cross for my sins and then resurrecting from the dead so that I might live. Thank you for doing that in love for me. Please come into my life now. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you. In your name I pray. Amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer together with me, or okay, uh, praise the Lord. You are now a member of the family of God. Jesus has come into your life. He has saved you and rescued you. And He's now become Lord of your life. Now, if you did that, uh, um, this is what I'd like you to do. Okay, uh, Look for a raise hand button on your screen. Uh, if you're watching this on a full screen um, mode, uh, you may need to exit your full screen mode and look for that button which says raise hand. Okay, Now, I'd like you to click on that so that uh, we can get a little bit of details from you so that we can send you information. Okay, Send you material that will help you in your now new journey uh, as, as a Christian. Some of you may not have prayed that prayer with me, but you were just listening in and uh, just thinking, well, I'm not so sure, maybe. Well, if you like, and I encourage you to do so, would you click on the live prayer button? Okay, if you click on the live prayer button, uh, you'll have an opportunity to talk to someone. Okay, I want to encourage you hey, if you've got questions, you want to clarify certain things, you know, uh, you just want to talk to somebody about it, click on the live prayer button and say, hey, can you tell me a little bit more about Jesus? Okay, there will be someone on the other side just going to just uh, chat with you. All right, do do that. You know, church, um, you know, we never leave by without offering ministry to people. And right now, at this time, there are some of you who uh, need a ministry of healing in your body. Okay, uh, you're experiencing ill health. All right, um, you are, you may already have a underlying illness. Uh, this seems to be getting worse. Uh, I want to pray. We, we want to pray for you. Okay, click on the live prayer button. Someone will come up to you and we we'll pray with you. Okay, online. Uh, they will chat with you. We do do that every single week. Okay, even though we are not physically together, we are still praying for people. You, at this time when we've been uh, locked up in the house as you were, with uh, your housemates or with your family, you know, uh, maybe relationships are strained. Or right now you're thinking about people that you haven't been able to meet and, and things weren't right. And there's the need for healing in relationships. You can pray for that too. But you know, right now because of all that's going on in our world, uh, economies are being uh, sh very much shaken. Uh, all of us are facing an uncertain future uh, economically, what, how that will translate uh, politically all around the world. With this uncertain future, some of you may be really anxious. Okay, I know the Bible says, do not be anxious, but in everything, to bring it to God in prayer. And we want to help you with that. So if you're anxious about stuff in your life, you're worried about your job, you're worried about your business, okay, you're worried about where the company is going, you're worried about the economy in general. Uh, there's so many things today that could make us anxious and there are grounds for that anxiety we want to pray with you because we have a heavenly father who is more than able to provide and we have a great high priest right there backing us making our case with us to the father so if that's you i want to ask you to click on the live prayer button all right look for it again if you're watching this on full screen Okay, you may need to exit your full screen view to see that button, live prayer. Click on it, 
one of the pastors and ministry leaders will come, will, will take the time to chat with you. I'm going to close, okay? But like I said, if you need ministry, do stick around, okay? And ask for prayer. I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence with us. Father, as you speak to every one of us, Father, we ask that your presence will be evident to us, each one in our homes, by your provision, by your assurance. Lord, we thank you that you are our Heavenly Father. You care for us more than you care for the flowers of the field, the birds of the air. Surely, you watch over us. So therefore, I pray, Father, as we bring our service toward a close, that as we are reminded that we have a future one day where we will be raised to a resurrection body, that one day Jesus will return and He will return to restore the world to what is right and good and perfect. Father, we thank you for the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, as we look into the week and to the weeks ahead of us, we ask you to help us relocate the center of our lives to where we are at now with Christ in the heavenlies with you. And now, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Well, Church, as we bring the service to a close, I'd like to leave this verse with you and I pray, okay, you don't go off without um, taking advantage of the opportunity for someone to pray with you. Okay, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Okay, so if you need prayer, don't go off without getting the opportunity to get someone to pray with you, all right? So do that, look for the um, live prayer button, click on it, someone will pray with you, okay? God bless you. Have a great week ahead of you, even if some of you go back to work. Okay, still, never mind. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay focused on God. God bless you.